Uh, next up is Feng Yen, uh, Director of Advertising for eBay. Oh, there it goes. It was there, and then now it's there. Um, um, Feng's going to take you through some of their strategies of how they achieve results with advertisers and they segment audiences. So please give a warm round of applause for Feng Yen. So, um, so I realize that this thing is a life of its own. Um, but I realize that we're a little bit over time, and I realize that I'm the last guy standing between you guys and the bar. So I'm going to try to keep it as concise as possible. But I did, um, I was reading some fresh research the other day about these kinds of events, and um, apparently only 40% of you will be listening to what I'm actually saying anyway. Um, apparently, oh, it is moving. Um, apparently, th um, I think, what was the data? 30% of you will be letting your mind drift. Apparently, 20% of you will be fooling around on your phones, probably answering emails and things like that. And 10% of you, and I'm not lying about this, 10% of you will apparently be having a sexual fantasy. So I am not here to judge you at all. I am simply here to get you through the next 20 minutes and hopefully get you to learn something. Good. OK. Um, better predictions, important, because they are important to what we do, right? Because the better we know whether someone's going to be in the market for a new car, or the better we know whether there's going to be an expecting mum expecting to buy a pram, the better we'll be able to launch new products and the better we'll be able to have effective marketing campaigns. So how do we make better predictions? And you know, I would say in the past, you know, our ancestors would have made ceremonial sacrifices to deities to work out more about the future, or they would have uh, looked into the all-seeing, all-knowing crystal ball in order to work out how to guide their decision-making. But we all know that currently we operate in the data-driven age and making accurate decisions is really a science. So what I really wanted to share with you guys today was a few of the tips and tricks that we use at eBay Advertising for our clients in order to help them make better predictions. So uh, a little bit about us first, in case, in case you didn't know uh, who we were. So I think a lot of you know us as one of the UK's biggest shopping marketplaces. But what a lot of you don't know is that we're also one of the UK's biggest media owners. So we have 19 million unique users that come to our platform every month across desktop, mobile, and tablet. We have over 6 billion ad impressions that are served to that audience month in, month out. And we reach over 40% of the UK adult population. This on top of what we believe to be one of the greatest repositories of consumer data on the web. So to give you a sense of the, the scale of this repository of data, by the end of this talk, on the eBay platform, we will have sold 12 pushchairs, 100 pair of jeans, 10 TVs, 28 tablets, 20 cars, and probably a couple of taxidermy animals. Now, the breadth of the kind of stuff that we sell on eBay is immense, but it's not just about the transactional velocity that we see in the site. It's also about a lot of the, a lot of the ancillary actions that our audience also perform that help add more depth to us keeping our fingers on the pulse of consumer insight whether it be the searches that they perform on the platform, the number of items that they view, the kinds of things that they bid for. So all of that adds to the tapestry of making more accurate predictions. Now, I'm going to go into uh, making a few points about um, uh, predictions that have not totally been accurate in the past. And I'm a massive movie geek in the same way that Cameron Harmon is. And I'm going to play a little bit of a game with you, right? So I'm going to bring up some movie uh, predictions that have not come true. and you'll probably very easily guess what the films are, but if you are a hardcore film geek and if you know what dates are relevant to these films, yell them out. I'm going to buy you a really nice drink at the bar afterwards if you know the dates to this first one. Any? Sorry? No? Another guess? No, the date here is the 21st of October. I'm getting very precise. 21st of October 2015 was the date that we predicted that we would be zipping around on hoverboards and unfortunately, we missed that date, and, and instead we have these horrible two-wheeled monstrosities clogging up the sidewalks. Does anyone know the significant date for this screen grab? No. This is very hard. Ooh, sorry? No, not 2020. So the date was the 29th of August, 1997. Judgment Day, the day the machines took over, the day that man mankind would be wiped out. Now, unfortunately, this did not happen, but also, unfortunately, they still keep churning out crappy Terminator films, so another great disappointment to the world. And finally, does anyone know the year that this seminal Jean-Claude Van Damme movie was set in? 
2004 was the year that we should have had time traveling law enforcement to enable us to go back in the past and rectify those horrible decisions that we sometimes make in life, like sending text messages to your ex after a few drinks. Unfortunately, this did not happen, so there are certain things in life that we've predicted that have really been horribly inaccurate. But there are also some things in life that are remarkably difficult to predict, because no matter how much you labor over the data or how much you analyze the situation, sometimes life happens serendipitously. So um, the Slinky is a great example of that. Uh, who knows the story around how the Slinky came to be? So the Slinky was actually invented in 1943 by um, an American engineer called Richard James, Rick James. Um, and Rick James was a, uh, working on a product using springs to try to stabilize nautical measurement uh, tools on, on board ships. And as he was working on this project one night, he actually tipped over off his shelf one of the springs that was a prototype, and he was amazed to see the spring walk off the shelf gracefully rather than fall off, and there was one of the greatest products ever developed. Does anyone know the story behind how Velcro was developed? Velcro, also developed in the 1940s, was developed by a, um, a Swiss engineer called George de Matea. And George was walking through the Swiss Alps with his big Bernese mountain dog, and what he noticed was that the buds of the flowers would get stuck to his dog's fur. And as he analyzed the buds of those flowers, he, he noticed that there was a, hoop and, a hook and loop system that would ultimately be the inspiration for the Velcro product. And finally, you know, something a little bit closer to our era, the iPhone. So uh, the iPhone uh, was famously quoted, well, actually, no, the technology writer for the New York Times, David Pope, was famously quoted in 2006 as saying, People keep asking me when Apple's going to release a cell phone, and my response is, probably never. It makes no sense for their business. And a year after that, Apple and Steve Jobs announced the iPhone to the world, and now we all get to experience the joy of playing Candy Crush when we really should be doing other things. But you know, moving on to the science of making better predictions. So I'm going to share with you guys five of the lessons that we use within our own business and for our advertising clients to try to help them make better decisions around how they operate their campaigns through eBay advertising and how they should generally think about the data that they sit on. Lesson number one, validating the efficacy of your data and thinking quite thoroughly about this notion of inferred data versus observed data. So by inferred, I mean, uh, are you deducing an outcome from a data signal or other data signals that may predict something that may happen in the future? as opposed to observed, which is I actually saw or captured the moment that that happened. So you know, if you're thinking about the difference between the two, if you're trying to compile a segment of luxury car owners, do you want the guy on the left who has posted a photo on social media in front of a car with a hashtag Ferrari? Or do you want the guy that you know based on your observed records has actually purchased a Ferrari? And the way that you collect the data is also very important in thinking about the quality of it. So what can often be found is that if data is self-reported, i.e. you collect that data through surveys or people have the opportunity to input them on their own volition, as opposed to it being self-observed, the self-imposed biases of that individual can sometimes take the quality of the data. For example, if you were to ask me, how many times in the last month have you eaten chicken cottage? I would say, hmm, Probably a couple of times, but actually, if you were to observe the data in the Chicken Cottage at Labrador Grove, you would know that that number is much closer to 12, maybe even 13. So, thinking about your observed data rather than your inferred data is a really key element of working out the quality and efficacy of your ability to make more accurate predictions. Lesson number two, understanding the impact of data decay. Um, so this notion of data decay is uh, very important in considering um, how accurate your predictions are going to be in terms of making future outcomes happen. And sometimes I say that data is kind of like pizza. When it's fresh out of the oven, it's pretty fantastic. The longer you leave it out, the worse it gets. Regardless of what my flatmate says, pizza does not get better with age. Right? Data decay for marketers is as nefarious as pizza decay is for my flatmate. So thinking about how you can validate and understand the windows with which your data starts to decay is very important. So at eBay, uh, we look at this sometimes by product type. So what we roughly know is that for a purchase like a motor vehicle, 
your period of consideration, i.e. constraining your data decay, can sometimes be up to six months. Whilst for a product like uh, a memory card, your data decay very quickly descends after about seven days once someone really knows that they need that product in order for their bigger electrical purchase to work. So data today is a super important part of how you think about uh, making more accurate predictions. Sometimes seasonality also plays an important uh, factor into understanding the window with which you could, you could constrain your data sets to decrease the data decay. So this chart uh, is a analysis that we did last Christmas to understand the consideration windows by certain product sets. So you can see at the top there, if you're in the market to try to sell someone a mobile phone or to try to persuade someone that they should gift a mobile phone, you've probably got about a two month window in order to get that done. And it's probably best for you to start that messaging towards the end of September before your data starts to decay. Whilst if you're trying to sell someone a DVD, you've probably got up until this, the last day before Christmas in order to make that uh, behavioral change happen. So thinking about data decay, decay is a key part of making uh, your predictions more accurate. Lesson number three. So using uh, hypothesis-driven uh, predictions in order to fuel what it is that you do. And what I simply mean by hypothesis-driven prediction is using logic combined with the validation of quality data in order to come up with that prediction. And sometimes that logic is really blankly staring, staring you in the face. So I'll share with you an example of how we did this, did this at eBay. So we were approached by one of our big advertising partners, SanDisk, and they wanted to find a way of reducing uh, wastage of their advertising campaigns running on eBay. So we pulled together our smartest of smart, smart guys in the office, our data scientists, our PhDs, into a room to try to work out different ways of doing this. And it was actually, it was the, the data intern, the data intern that actually hypothesized, well, if someone has recently bought a device that has an empty SD slot, like a digital camera or a PlayStation 4, they're probably, probably going to be in the market for an SD card soon. And we went, Eureka, that's almost a little bit too logical to be true. We packaged up that audience, we turned it into a targeting segment, we ran a campaign for SanDisk, and bang, their sales on, of uh, memory cards on eBay tripled. So, you know, it's, it, it, the hypothesis-driven logic of what can go into forming a strong prediction can sometimes be right in front of you, but it's important to validate that through quality data to make sure that you are actually on the right track. Um, sometimes, however, you can't logically hypothesize what's going on, and you need to delve into what we call serendipitous predictions. And much in the same way that George de Mitral, as he was wandering through the Swiss Alps, serendipitously came up with Velcro, sometimes you need to wander through your data sets in order to find what the logical brain cannot normally see. And the example that I wanted to share with you guys was actually when we were jumping into um, our data in our cooking and baking category at the height of the Great British Bake Off, which as an Australian, I do not understand the cultural relevance and why year in, year out, it is your highest rating show, but it is what it is. And what we found quite surprisingly was something that no one in the team expected. So we found as many men buying baking products as we did females buying baking products, right? And this goes completely contrary to what the client thought, completely contrary to what we thought. And what we did was we uh, approached one of our uh, advertising clients, Co-op Co Electrical, and we created a campaign for them that ran in line with the final of the Great British Bake Off, and they sold as many appliances to male bakers as they did to female bakers. So this notion of uh, serendipitous prediction, I think is a fantastic one because it's where your competition is not looking, right? It is where you will gain the greatest market share if you are brave enough and bold enough to be able to pursue these kinds of predictions. And the fifth and final lesson that I wanted to share with you guys is to uh, productize your predictions. So if you've made a prediction and you've validated that it's a good thing, then just do what Hollywood does and just churn that out and keep squeezing that for what it's worth uh, until you start to see it decay. Because you know, the, a lot of the times what you will find is that the logic, whether it be hypothesis-driven or serendipitous-driven, is going to reign true for many cases in the future. So standardize the queries that get you that data set. Standardize the way that you refresh that audience. Um, and what we did recently at eBay was we developed a predictive data set 
to better target new mums. And the way that we did that was we analyzed different behavioral shopping elements from different signals from different categories to try to better segment down the various stages of motherhood, starting from expectancy all the way through to uh, looking after a toddler. And what we found when we ran this, ran this new predictive modeling with uh, a well-known uh, high street pharmacy was that their campaign click-through rate was two times that of if they would just target the context of our baby category. So then we've now packaged this up and it's out there on offer to every single FMCG company that wants to buy it. So productizing your predictions so that you can get more leverage out of them. Now, that brings me to the end of the presentation. So to sum it back all up, validate the efficacy of your data by understanding the difference between what data is inferred and what data is observed and make sure that you can use observed data wherever possible. Make sure that you understand the impact of your data decay Data decays in the same way that pizza does. Use quality data to explore hypothesis-driven predictions. Sometimes the best option is right in front of you. And sometimes wander through that data to find the serendipitous predictions. And make sure that you are getting as much leverage out of your predictions by productizing them. Now, I wanted to leave you guys on um, a little video. So we, we quite often l keep our fingers on what's at the forefront of you know, predictive analytics and technology. And I wanted to share with you uh, a new methodology that uh, we saw recently that we thought was kind of interesting by a uh, great data scientist called Jimmy Fallon, where uh, he developed a technique. Let's release puppy the predictions. Puppies. And you're essentially using puppy Labradors to try to predict the outcome hey of a binary event. Ooh. And you can Ooh, see wow. here. Oh, uh, landslide. Landslide, landslide, landslide right there. Gone. I think it's Denver obvious Broncos. the winner are the Denver Broncos. Which, if you know your American sports, wow. actually won that Super Bowl. That was a landslide right so there. So highly the accurate way predicted of predicting it. the future. Right there. Talk to your data there? scientists about it. Talk to your CEO about it. Oh, look at that. And Good I'm job, done. Gary. Thank uh, you. We have the winner right there. The Denver Broncos will be signed to Super Bowl champs. Congratulations to the Denver Broncos, Peyton Manning, and Gary Frick Jr. Good job, Gary. At least you can use that better than I can. Yeah. Thank you very much for following. Um, we do have time uh, for one moment, because I will be uh, one moment of questions, because I'll be keeping my closing remarks very succinct. Um, so I'll open it up to you folks. Um, does anyone want to ask Fong a question? We have oh, the lady down here. Oh, it's coming to you now. Thank you. Hello. Um, question about inferred versus um, observed. Uh, we're introducing a preference center where we're asking our customers actually what brands they want to hear about. And there's a bit of an internal argument at the office as to how much we should um, use that data um, above what they actually book. Um, it's, we're explicitly asking them to opt into certain brands, but do you mm -hmm. have an opinion on that? Yeah, so um, I, I wouldn't completely dismiss um, infer data and I wouldn't completely uh, dismiss self-informed data inputs because whilst I think the most accurate data are the ones where you actually observe the behavior of an individual, that self-bias that you see when an individual inputs in their own preferences can sometimes be um, negative, in the example of me wanting, not wanting you to know that I eat chicken cottage a lot, but sometimes they can be aspirational, letting you know that there's a brand that I would like to, like to hear more from that I don't purchase a lot today. So I think there's value in using both to complement each other, but actually being quite precise about the usage of that data. Anyone else? No? Oh, we have one right here. Hi, good afternoon. Okay, so the Q&A. Um, obviously, uh, a company like eBay has a lot of what we call first-party data, and it's awesome. And um, But how, what's your opinion about external data? Because a lot of advertisers actually have the problem that they don't have that much first-party data, and they actually need to get more out. So what's your stance on that? Um, so I think that the, the data sharing economy is a funny one, because uh, I, I noticed a few trends. So the first is that whenever anyone thinks about the value of their data, from everything that I can see, everything is inherently overpriced. Everyone thinks their data is the best thing since sliced cheese. Um, so that's again, one part of it, right? The economic, economics of it essentially needs to work out in order for that data to be utilized more. But I think that in the world of mobile, 
where so many of us are flying bl blind, that data simply needs to, it's probably gonna be one of the key things that unlocks the, this, uh, dis, uh, this gap between the amount of time people spend on mobile and the amount of money that's going to mobile. So I think that the only way for us to bridge that is for more uh, people to make their data accessible in a safe way and for more companies to think about how they leverage that when they lack data. Anyone else? One more, we'll do one more right up front here. Thank you, hi. Um, <clears throat> with the predictive analytics, I guess the biggest challenge is making sure the, the whole database is complete and you've got complete data. What would you say is the next step afterwards? Let's say we live in the ideal world where your data is complete. Uh, I'm gonna approach this from, from a personnel point of view, right? What kinds of teams or people do you need in order to take that next step? Because I completely agree with you. Your architecture needs to be in place first because if your house is not in order, there's no point fishing around for anything useful because it may not be useful to you at all. Um, but what I found, and what we found at eBay that's quite interesting, is that um, we find that the best output of our work from a predictive analytics point of view, when we couple together people who have very creative minds with people who have very structured, pragmatic minds. Because if you think about um, this notion that I brought up earlier around uh, the serendipitous versus the hypothesis-driven, you know, sometimes you can come up with great hypo hypothesis-driven uh, predictions because people are very creative about how they build one connection to another connection to another connection. And actually what we do within our organization is we have this once a month, two hour riffing session where we just get a few brains together and we just throw silly ideas about, oh, I heard that uh, crocheted bikinis are a thing. Can we see whether there's some kind of correlation between that and our ability to sell something else? And then we go off and then we test and we validate them. So I think having creative minds helps you unlock that quite well. But then on the serendipitous side, sometimes you just need people that are just willing to put the headphones on and delve into the data to find those correlations and trends. And that's when you can find the best serendipity. So um, I hope that answers your question, but that's how I think about kind of going from getting your architecture right to actually getting something useful out of your data. Thanks.